Thank you so much for being here. Again, many, many, many thanks. Thank you, J.D. Forgive me for being a little choked up. For I have not stood on this Odeon stage in 157 years. Yes, November 8, 1866 was the last time I stood here. I was fresh back from the Sandwich Islands, which you call the Hawaiian Islands now. So if you'll come with me now, I'd just like to step back and remember 1866 right here. Where to begin? The chief pride of the island of Maui is her dead volcano of Haleakala. We climbed a thousand feet up the side of this isolated colossus one day, camped, and next day climbed the remaining 9,000 feet. The sublimest spectacle I ever witnessed was the sunrise from the summit of Haleakala through the bottom of a tumbler. <laughs> One particularly lovely day on Maui, I observed a bevy of naked native ladies bathing in the ocean. Well, this was the sort of local color I was looking for for the Sacramento Union. So I went down and sat on their clothes well, to keep them from being stolen. The sea was rising. It was a dangerous situation. I shouted for them to come out, but they ignored my warnings and continued to frolic in the sea. It was a heartwarming sight. When I got up to the go, I noticed my horse was asleep. Which goes to show you there is a difference between a man and a horse. You cannot depend upon a horse to gather news for the Sacramento Union. Everybody in the archipelago is educated from the highest to the lowest thanks in large part to the missionaries. And yet every now and again you come across instances of ignorance that are simply revolting, simply degrading to the human race. Well, think of it. A place where the ten takes the ace. But let us not dwell on such things. They make a person ashamed. Well, the missionaries are always going to fix that, but no, they keep putting it off and putting it off. And the country is going to go down and down until someday you will see a pair of jacks beat a straight flush. <laughs> As to immigrants, the first year they collect shells. The second year they collect shells and drink. The third year they do not collect shells. <laughs> The Sandwich Islands are to this day the peacefulest, restfulest, dreamiest haven of refuge for a worn and weary spirit that the surface of the earth can offer. These islands affect you just as all things that you instantly recognize as perfect affect you. Perfect music, perfect art, perfect joy. The Sandwich Islands are one long slumbering Sabbath. The good that die there experience no change, for they fall asleep in one heaven and wake up in another. 
but that is a program for another day. Well, Jane Dean tells me we have some historians in the house. People tell me I'm a historian where facts are not essential. <laughs> And I understand we have some educators with us here at the Odeon this afternoon. I must confess to you I have no formal education. In truth, I am as unlettered as the backside of a tombstone. <laughs> but I've gained worlds of knowledge at second hand. None of it correct. <laughs> no, all you need for success in this life is ignorance and confidence, <laughs> then success is sure. <laughs> My father died when I was 11. I had to go to work in the printing house. So the printing house became my high school, the steamboat of my university. I never let my schooling interfere with my education. <laughs> so I wrote to my brother in 1866, I have had a call to literature of a low order, humorous, to excite the mirth of God's creatures. And 150 years later, 2016, America minted her first coin for literature, the Mark Twain commemorative coin. The only thing our 114th Congress could get together on. <laughs> you might be wondering how Mark Twain can know about 2016. Well, for a very good reason. The reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> Well, along the way, I managed to acquire some entrepreneurial excesses. Yes, I never saw an opportunity until it had ceased to be one. <laughs> and whenever I got in on the ground floor of a commercial venture, there was an SOB in the basement. <laughs> Alexander Graham Bell gave me the first telephone in a private residence. Yes. But I took it out. I never got any calls. <laughs> a scientist told me he could convert 97% of the energy in a lump of coal to steam. So I retained him at $35 a week to continue with his research and development. But I could tell from his gait and his breath he was drinking $36 worth of whiskey a week. I never did find out where he got the other dollar. They tell me I was the very first person in the world to apply a typewriter to literature. Yes, I was working on Tom Sawyer at the time, about 1874. It was a Remington. But that Remington threw me into such fits of profanity, I could feel my morals going down and down. So I gave that infernal machine to Howells, William Dean Howells, editor of the Atlantic. His morals never recovered. <laughs> the Washington Post wrote one morning, if you want to know what to invest in, Avoid what Mark Twain is investing in. <laughs> I invested in the Page Typesetter. The Page Compositor had 18,000 moving parts, all moving in the wrong direction. <laughs> we were racing the linotype to the marketplace and lost. So there I was at 59 years of age, bankrupt when the life expectancy was not even 59 years of age. The billows of hell began to roll over me. The devil was on deck and having everything his way. Until Henry Rogers invited me up to his office 
Henry was the number two man at Standard Oil, and he took an interest in my financial affairs. He told me, Sam, you can afford to be money poor, you cannot afford to be character poor. You must pay back 100 cents on the dollar. This was a dismal revelation to me. But Henry helped plan an around the world lecture tour on a steamer. And off we went, my wife, Olivia, our middle daughter, Clara, and I sent every half dime I made to Henry to invest. Subsequently, I would write a book about that world tour, following the equator, and dedicate that book to Henry Rogers. And three years later, 1898, I received a cable from Rogers. Sam, you're in the black, having paid back 100 cents on the dollar. I learned from Henry Rogers, there is no statute of limitations to honor. Honor has no statute of limitations. And were it not for Henry Rogers, the only shelter I would have today would be an umbrella and a borrowed one at that. I had a letter from a friend last week. He said, Sam, that friend of yours, Rogers, he's a good enough fellow, I suppose. It's just too bad his money is tainted. I wrote him back. I said, you're right. It's twice tainted. Taint yours and taint mine. <laughs> But just here, I'd like to mention the riches of my life, my wife, Olivia. I first saw her cameo. We were off the coast of Turkey in the Bay of Smyrna on the Quaker City excursion from America to Europe and the Holy Land. The first of its kind. It was billed as a picnic at sea. In truth, it was more like a funeral procession without a corpse. So I had to embroider my letters to the Alta California that would later go into my first full-length book, The Innocents Abroad. But the riches of my life came aboard the Quaker City. When I wandered into Charlie Langdon's stateroom, and there on his bedstand was a cameo of his sister, Olivia. And from that day to this, she has never been off my mind. Young people seem to think love is the swiftest of all growths, but in fact, it is the slowest. No man, no woman can know true love until they've been married a quarter of a century. Olivia and I were happily married 34 years. And I was born reserved as to endearments of speech and caresses. So hers broke upon me like the summer waves break upon Gibraltar. She had a heart that was tropically warm. It is in the heart that the riches lie. A loving heart is riches, riches enough. Without it, intellect is poverty. And Olivia possessed a heart of finer metal than any gold that was ever mined or minted. So blessed be that moment that brought us near together and taught me to know the goodness of her heart and the sweetness of her spirit. Whoever fell within the influence of her beautiful nature was her willing slave forevermore. So if ever there was a man who had reason to be thankful for divine providence, it is I. I'll say this about Olivia. Wheresoever she was, there was Eden. But I don't want to get sentimental on you. 
I thought in light of my 187th birthday, I might like to share with you some secrets to my longevity and some etiquette on getting into heaven that you might find handy someday. I should begin at the beginning. I remember the day I was born. Everybody came around to look me over. And I shouldn't have minded if somebody had paid me a compliment, but nobody did. Might have been the mustache. <laughs> when I was nine days old, I discovered if a pin were sticking me and I advertised it in the customary fashion, I would be petted and coddled in the most agreeable way. But when my parents discovered there was no pin, they realized another liar had been added to the world's supply. <laughs> my mother always said I was a wellspring of truth. You just couldn't bring it all up in one bucket. I'm old enough now to have been mentioned in the Bible. Yes, you look in Matthew, you will see, Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, walk with him twain. <laughs> Ostensibly, I'm an old man now. I've known a great many troubles. Most of them never happened. <laughs> when I was a younger man studying for the gallows, I could remember anything, whether it happened or not. Now it seems I can only remember the latter. At 187, a man can be an ass without being an optimist. But he cannot be an optimist without being an ass. I might be the only person you meet today who can golf his age now. Yes, right-handed, left-handed, doesn't matter really. The last time I played golf was with Woodrow Wilson down in Bermuda. And I remember his turning to me on that beautiful fairway and saying, Sam, good sportsmanship is not picking up lost golf balls while they're still rolling. <laughs> Pocket full of them, yeah. No, golf is a good walk. Spoiled. But I have achieved my 187 years in the usual way. That is by sticking to a scheme of life that would kill anybody else. You cannot get to old age by another man's road. My habits protect my life while they would assassinate you. <laughs> we have no permanent habits until we are 40. Then they begin to harden. Presently, they petrify. <laughs> then business begins. In the matter of diet, I've been persistently strict in sticking to things that did not agree with each other's company and letting them fight it out on the inside. This has always worked for me until this last Nevada day. I stopped frolicking around with minced meat pie and brandy after midnight. <laughs> Up until this last Nevada day, I always thought minced meat pie and brandy was like that gun on the wall. Not loaded. <laughs> as for drinking, I don't have any rules as for drinking. When others are drinking, uh, I like to help. <laughs> I have found that a tumbler full of whiskey in the early evening is a preventive against toothache. <laughs> I've never had the toothache. <laughs> and I don't intend to have one. <laughs> As for smoking, well, I came into the world asking for a light. I'll probably go out blowing smoke rings. But I'm smoking in moderation now. I never smoke more than one of these at a time. Never smoke while asleep anymore. Never refrain while awake. This is a good rule. Wouldn't answer for everybody trying to get to be 187 but it answers for me. I 
buy my cigars by the barrel. Sixty years ago, I paid six dollars a barrel, but my taste has improved here lately. Now, I pay seven. That includes the barrel. No, my cigars are manufactured right here in Dayton for the clergy. Make noise when they burn, like a forest fire crackling. But mosquitoes take no interest in me whatsoever. Women neither, for that matter. No, it's easy to give up smoking. I've done it thousands of times. As for exercise, I've never taken any exercise, and I don't intend to take any. Exercise is loathsome. I've never seen any advantage in being tired. Whenever I get the urge to exercise, I go lie down somewhere till it passes away. The only exercise I get anymore is as a pallbearer for friends who exercise all their lives. Oh, and never put off until tomorrow what you can put off until the day after tomorrow. As for profanity, well, there are times when profanity provides a relief denied even to prayer. And when it comes to pure ornamental cursing, the average American is gifted above the sons of men. Oh, I used to be able to utter an oath that would knock the dust up where it struck the ground. When angry, count four. When very angry, go ahead and swear. It's the people's poetry. <laughs> Our wonderful friend, ally, and 30-year housekeeper, Katie Leary, wrote about me in her book, Mr. Clemens swore like an angel. I like that. I had a lady friend who was ill last week asked me, Sam, what can I do to feel better? I feel awful. Well, I told her what my doctor told me. I said, dear, you must give up drinking and smoking and swearing. She said, but Sam, that would be easy. I don't drink and I don't smoke. And I've never sworn. Well, there it was. She had been neglecting her habits. Here was this poor moral pauper, a sinking ship with no baggage to throw over. Oh yes, one little bad habit might have saved her. So I repeat and emphasize my maxim. You cannot get to old age by another man's road. The important thing, the essential thing, is that we endeavor so to live that when we come to die, even the undertaker will be sorry. Now I promised you some etiquette on getting into heaven. When you get up to the pearly gates, don't speak first. Let St. Peter speak first. And don't start a sentence with say or so or lie. And don't try to take a selfie with him. <laughs> Hell is full of people who have tried that. <laughs> and don't take your dog. Heaven goes by favor. If it went by merit, your dog would go in and you would stay out. <laughs> oh, and if you get in, don't tip St. Peter. Publicly. <laughs> Well, you might be wondering how Mark Twain got all the way from the Mississippi River to Nevada. I'm going to tell you, if I can remember. You see, when I was a boy, my comrades and I in a little village on the western banks of the Mississippi River had but one permanent ambition, to be a steamboatman. Here was a chance for adventure, excitement, New Orleans. And we used to measure the depth of the water on the Mississippi River with a sounding line. It was a lead line that had a large knot at the safe water mark. Oh, those paddle wheels needed 12 feet of water to turn their magic. 
or two fathoms. But we didn't say two back then on the river, no, we used the old biblical term for two, twain. Well, that cub, 12 years old, would cast that line off the bow. And if they had plenty of water, he'd shout up to the pilot house, deep six. And as the water got shallow, mark three-quarter twain. And when that knot appeared in two fathoms, he'd get concerned. For if the pilot didn't get that rig straightened out, they might go up onto a shoal and break up. So when he saw that knot at two fathoms, he shouted up to the pilot house, what do you suppose? <laughs> yes. And when people heard Mark Twain on the river, they were interested in what was going on. And I liked that. And I never forgot it. Oh, I didn't think I had brains enough to be a pilot. And if I did, I wouldn't have the strength to carry those brains around unless I went on crutches. But eventually I did work my way up into that pilot house, thanks to Horace Bigsby. By the shadow of death, but he was one lightning pilot. He told me I didn't know enough to pilot a cow down a lane. And then I'd have to learn the entire river by heart, which was a dismal revelation to me. For my memory was never loaded with anything but blank cartridges. <laughs> What's the shape of Walnut Island, son? You think I could have guessed that one? <laughs> But in April of 1859, at 23 years of age, I received my license to navigate the mighty Mississippi. I've had many occupations since. I've been everything from a newspaper editor to a cow catcher and a locomotive. <laughs> but I've never found anything I like better than piloting a riverboat. And I took a measureless pride in it. It was novelty of king without a keeper, an absolute monarch who was absolute in sober truth and not by fiction of words. I piloted the John J. Rowe. She was as slow as an island and as comfortable as a farm. It wasn't any more trouble to steer her than it was to count the Republican vote in a South Carolina election. <laughs> she was so slow that when she finally did sink at Mandarin Bend, it was four years before the owners heard of it. <laughs> I learned to read the face of the water as one would call the news from the morning paper. A score of centuries has not changed the mulatto complexion of that water. It comes from the turbulent bank cave in Missouri. And a tumbler full of it holds nearly an acre of land in solution. <laughs> yes, I get this back from the bishop of the diocese. You let a glass of Mississippi water stand half an hour, you can separate the land from the water as easy as Genesis. But the natives don't take it like that, no. When they find an inch of mud in the bottom of a glass of drinking water, they mix it up. When you drink a glass of Mississippi water, you need a glass of some other kind of water to wash it down with. <laughs> and then you can grow corn in your stomach if you want to. No, Mississippi water is too thick to drink and too thin to plow. <laughs> but it's good for baptizing and river boating. No, Mississippi will always have her own way. Those engineers over at West Point might as well try to bully the comets in their courses as to try to bully the Mississippi into behaving. 
I've seen that river so wide as it is today, it only has one bank. I was piloting on the river when we first learned that South Carolina had gone out of the Union. This was in December of 1860. And by the summer of 61, the first wash of the wave of war broke upon the shores of Missouri. I took the last boat up out of New Orleans after the fall of Fort Sumter. Well, 15 of us gathered together in a secret place by night and formed ourselves into a military company, the Marion Rangers. I arrived riding a small yellow donkey. So small, my feet touched the ground on both sides. And he was able to bend around and bite me on the legs. <laughs> I was carrying a skillet, a squirrel gun, and an open umbrella to keep the sun off. They made me second lieutenant. <laughs> we had no first lieutenant, I don't know why. Well, for a while, life was idly delicious. There was nothing tomorrow until some farmers brought the alarm one day. They said it was rumored that the enemy was approaching over Hyde's Prairie. Well, this brought sharp and general consternation. So in the confusion, we did not know which way to retreat. Captain Lyman had some calming words, however. He said, and as much as the enemy is approaching over Hyde's Prairie, our course is simple. All we need to do is not to retreat towards him. <laughs> Any other direction will answer our needs perfectly. <laughs> well, Captain Lyman received a great many compliments. He said to protect the camp from surprise, I should post a picket. So I ordered Sergeant Bowers to go out to Hines Prairie and post a picket until midnight. He said he wouldn't go on account of the weather. So I ordered the others to go. They said they wouldn't go in any kind of weather. So for the next two weeks, we learned more about retreating than the man who invented retreating. I was incapacitated from retreating. And in that little time, that two weeks, the desire to kill people to whom I had not been introduced had passed away. So I seceded from the secession. <laughs> well, the unget-aroundable fact is I was missing in action before a shot was fired. Some said I was too irregular, even for the irregulars. But as good fortune would have it, thanks to Mr. Lincoln's inauguration, my brother was appointed secretary to the Silver Territory, Nevada. Yes, so I fancied myself to be secretary to the secretary. And I purchased a $150 fare each on the Overland Stagecoach out of St. Joe. And out we came at a spanking gate with our six shooters, a deck of cards, and a six pound unabridged Webster's Dictionary. We should have left it behind. It wasn't a good dictionary, it didn't have any modern words in it, only obsolete words that Noah Webster used when he was a child. Well, for example, it defined a carbuncle as a kind of a rare jewel. No, humor has no place in a dictionary. And every time we avalanche from one side of that stagecoach to the other, the dictionary came behind, and every time it came, it damaged somebody. <laughs> oh, the first trip across it barked Dorian's elbow. Next time it came, it hurt me in the stomach area. And the third trip, it bent old Mr. Bemis' nose up 
to where he could look down his nostrils. <laughs> no, I don't believe the dictionary has been any benevolence to society. It's a pretty uncreative mind that cannot find more than one way to spell a word. Don't you think? <laughs> we entertained ourselves by playing seven up with a deck of cards. It was so old and worn and greasy, you could read it from the back side better than you could the front side. <laughs> I wore a Smith & Wesson 7 shooter. My brother Orion had a Navy Colt 6 shooter. But Mr. Bemis, Mr. Bemis had the original pepper box and Allen. All six chambers discharged at the same time. And when that happened, the only safe place in all the region was behind it. <laughs> For if it didn't get what it was after, it'd fetch up something else. <laughs> but you want to see a jackass rabbit get up and hump himself, that's the weapon you want, <laughs> is the hammer. <laughs> well, 20 days on the over. Once we heard the thunder of hooves push back the flap, and there was the Pony Express galloping past, like the belated fragment of a storm. And so sudden was it all, and so like a flash of unreal fancy, that were it not for the flake of white foam left quivering and perishing on the mail sack, we might have been left in doubt as to whether we saw a pony and a rider at all. They were so fast. But imagine with me, if you will, we climb up on top of the box at dawn in our long johns, smoke our pipes and cigars, and watch the sunrise on the prairie. Even to this day, it thrills me to think of the wild sense of freedom that used to make the blood dance in our veins on those fine overland mornings. And at last, we disembarked in the Silver Land. This was in August of 1861. And back then, I have to tell you, Carson City was the most uninhabitable place on Earth. Nothing grew there. Even the birds, when they flew over, carried their own provisions. <laughs> But we hiked into the foothills and looked back on Carson, nestled in that black sandy desert, and surrounded by such prodigious mountains that they seemed to expand your soul until you felt yourself spreading into a colossus. And in that instant, you were seized with a burning desire to stretch forth your hand, put Carson in your pocket, and walk off with it. It was beautiful, really. In exploring the sink, we traveled down the Carson River a ways. When one is accustomed to the monstrous mile-wide Mississippi, he grows accustomed to associating the word river with a certain degree of watery grandeur. So when one stands on the shores of the Carson, he's disappointed. Oh, one of the most vigorous forms of exercise one can contrive is to run and jump across the Carson until he's overheated and then get down and drink it dry. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a moist ditch, is what it is. If it were my river, I wouldn't leave it out of doors at night. <laughs> And I could see I was going to need some transportation while in Carson City, so I attended an auction and bought a genuine Mexican plug. Well, I didn't know what a genuine Mexican plug was, really, but I bought it on the advice of a man I later found out was the auctioneer's brother. Well, his tail had been chopped off, or he sat down on it wrong at one time or to other, but anyways, he was proud of it. But this left him only his heels with which to fight off the flies. 
Well, with some help of some others, some holding his head and some holding his tail, I was able to climb onto that steed. But my feet slipped through the stirrups on the inside, so I was handcuffed at the ankles, and he knew it. So he put his feet together, all of them, in a bunch, lowered his back and fired me five feet into the air. And somebody shouted out, whoa, don't he fuck. Well, I came back down on the saddle, but the laughter this provoked, he took for applause, fired me up again. And this time I came down on the high hum. Thank you. This was too much variety for me. So I decided to get off. But now he was standing straight up on his hind legs, walking around like a member of Congress. <laughs> you might think I was afraid, but I wasn't. I knew I could stay on him, so long as his ears did not pull out. <laughs> Suddenly I was in the air again, and when I came back down, that genuine Mexican blood was gone. So I dug myself out of the ground and made up my mind that if that auctioneer's brother's funeral was held while I was in Carson City, I would cancel all other recreations and attend it. Some suspected Bigler had copperhead tendencies, was a southern sympathizer. One detractor asked, how can you name a lake with no bottom after a man who is all bottom? <laughs> Our Native American Washoe Paiute Shoshone called it Dao Aga, Lake of the Sky. They said it was 11 miles over the ridge from Carson. So my friend John Kinney and I shouldered an axe and a couple of blankets apiece, and off we went tramping across the flatland. We toiled laboriously up one ridge a thousand miles high, looked over, no lake there. So we descended the other side, toiled up the next ridge, 4,000 miles high, no lake. So we sat down and wished we had a couple of gentlemen from the mines to hire to curse those who had beguiled us so. And thus refreshed, we resumed our march with renewed vigor. And at last, Lake Tahoe burst upon us. This noble sheet of blue water lifted 6,200 feet above the level of the sea. And I exclaimed to my friend John Kenny, I said, the fairest picture the whole earth affords. Don't you think? We hiked down to the water's edge. There were perhaps 15 people living throughout the wide circumference of that lake at the time. We were going to claim a timber ranch and become wealthy. They needed timber over on the Comstock. Well, at the water's edge, we found a small skiff that had been left behind by the brigade boys, and we rowed that small skiff north on the east shore. Well, John rowed. <laughs> Not that I have anything against exertion, I don't. It's just that I get sick when I sit backwards when I work. That three-mile pole brought us to a campsite they had talked about. It was growing dark, so we spread our blankets between the warm boulders there, and soon enough, fell asleep. Careless of the procession of ants that entered through rents in our clothing to explore our persons. 
And if our consciences have any sins upon them, they had to adjourn court for the night. But we slept without movement, awoke in the same positions, thoroughly refreshed. So much so that we held foot races in the sand to tone down our physical vigor and exuberance of spirit. Well, John held foot races in the sand. And I held his hat. Oh, back then to claim property at Tahoe, all you had to do was to build a home and fence it in. And that was yours by the Homestead Act. 160 acres free. So we found a stand of yellow pine we liked, about 300 acres, and started in on our fence. Which is to say, we cut down some trees so that they fell to form an enclosure with some pretty wide gaps in it. We cut down three trees apiece. But we found it to be such heartbreaking work. We rested our case on those trees. And if a little land escaped out through the gaps, well, let it go. We weren't going to work ourselves to death to save a few acres of Tahoe land. And then we started in in our home, a log cabin. But it took the balance of the afternoon to trim one log. So we decided that perhaps a log cabin was too elaborate and that a more modest architecture would satisfy the law. So we built our home, our Tahoe home, out of brush. <laughs> oh yes, one had to watch the home while the other cut brush. We didn't both turn our backs on our home at the same time for fear of losing it. It had such a strong family resemblance to the surrounding vegetation. <laughs> then we built a campfire, and I'm a little ashamed to admit this to you, but the pine needles had stacked up so to where they rather exploded like gunpowder. And the fire raced up the ridge line, jumped from ridge back to ridge back till the whole mountainside was ablaze. And we had to take to the water for our safety. But now you must remember back then, every 10 to 20 years, a low grade fire, a low intensity fire, crept through that conifer forest. Even the animals were able to outrun it. So I like to take credit for the first prescribed burn in the time I pass. Please hold your applause. And we paddled around on logs out here on the lake of the sky. It was like balloon voyaging. The water was so clear you could count the scales on a cutthroat trout at 80 feet. I had a forest ranger question me on that fact the other night. Only because she said a lake trout doesn't have any scales. <laughs> so I've learned not to tell fish stories where they know you. <laughs> But we'd be paddling around out there in our logs and you'd see a building looming up out of the water at you. And then it would turn into a cathedral until you realized as you passed over it was but a boulder perhaps 20 feet down. But the water was so clear it magnified everything. The water was clearer than the air. And the air was the air that angels breathe. I wrote to my sister Pamela out in Missouri. I said, Mila, you must come out here to Lake Tahoe. Inside of three weeks, you'll have the strength to knock a bull down with your fist if you want to. <laughs> three weeks of camp life at Lake Tahoe will restore an Egyptian mummy to its pristine vigor. <laughs> I don't mean the oldest and driest of mummies. <laughs> But the fresher ones. <laughs> I knew a man who went there to die once, but he made a failure of it. He was but a shadow when he first arrived, and a very poor sort of shadow at that. And inside of three weeks, he was eating all he could hold, sleeping out of doors regularly, and chasing game up and down those 3,000 foot cliffs for recreation. 
This is not a fancy sketch, I'm telling you, but the truth, the frozen truth. We never slept in our home, our Tahoe home. We didn't want to strain it. <laughs> but if there is a happier life than the life that we led in our timber ranch at Lake Tahoe in 1861, it is a life I've not read about in books. We saw not one other person in three weeks. We heard nothing but the sound of the waves, the sign of the pond, and every now and again the far-off thunder of an avalanche. The eye suffered but one grief, that it must close sometimes in sleep. It was a veritable habitation with the gods. No, if Lake Tahoe does not cure whatever ails you, I'll bury you at my own expense. <laughs> well, I tried my hand at prospecting, yes, but I didn't have any luck. I soon enough discovered a silver mine worth nothing but a hole in the ground with a fool at the bottom and a liar at the top. <laughs> but I did one thing right. I wrote a letter to the editor of the Territorial Enterprise in Virginia City. It was a burlesque of a 4th of July speech that George Turner made. Turner was our Chief Justice and he was out stumping the territory at the time. And his speech began, I was sired by the great American Eagle. We'll draw a curtain of charity over the rest of the speech. <laughs> and I concluded my article by stating, I cannot complete this essay, for the type cases will have run out of capital I. <laughs> and I called that little squib, Professor Personal Pronoun, <laughs> and signed it, Josh. Yes, Josh, I was looking for a nom de guerre, a cognomen. Once before, I had used E. Panamondus, a drastic lab. <laughs> Didn't sound so good. So sometime later, I took Thomas Jefferson Snodgrass. <laughs> that didn't sound so good either. But on the strength of that letter, Professor Personal Pronoun, signed Josh, I was offered a job as a reporter at the Territorial Enterprise at $25 a week. And Joe Goodman, the publisher, told me when I signed on, Sam, you have but one responsibility here. Get your facts straight. <laughs> then you can distort them as much as you like. <laughs> so we never let the truth stand in the way of a good story back then. No, I learned in Virginia City a good lie can travel twice around the globe before the truth gets its boots on. <laughs> Isn't that so? Which is not to say we were trying to foist an untruth off on an unsuspecting public, no. Our little points were obvious sagebrush humor, and Nevada was built on tall tales. We had three kinds of stories back then. We had stretchers, that stretched the truth a little beyond the horizon of fact. Lifters that would actually lift the furniture. <laughs> and powder burners. Here lately, I've stopped lying altogether since the amateurs have taken over the field. <laughs> well, $25 a week might not sound like a lot of money today, I understand. But you must remember back then, 20 cents would buy you an entire meal at the Delta Saloon. And that included your sarsaparilla or your tarantula juice. We had a drink back then called a tarantula juice. Nobody knew all that went into the tarantula juice, but the last thing they did to it to give it dignity was to strain it through a cane bottom chair. <laughs> Well, to get the big lumps out. <laughs> oh, two tarantula juices would turn a man's skin to white fish scales. It was so tough a dog could bite him and he wouldn't know until he read about it in the papers. <laughs> Brought on premature 
decrepitude. <laughs> no, you can set it down as a maxim. A diet of whiskey produces rowdyism as naturally as turtle soup puts fat on an alderman. The Teamsters used to trade punches continuously as if for exercise. Fifty-two saloons we had in that town in my day. And no town drunk. No? We took turns. <laughs> well, I could see that this was no place for a good Presbyterian. So I didn't remain one very long. I remember one Sunday morning we were holding foot races on C Street after church. We must have held 14, 15 heats before we crowned our champion, hoisted him up on our shoulders, were parading him around. When a courtesan of the Comstock, a friend of Julia Bullett's, shouted down from a second story window, I got a hundred dollars as I can beat your man from my door to the end of the block. Well, Virginia City always was a betting man's territory. But I never saw money change hands like that before. Our champion jogged over to her door, whereupon she burst through that doorway, fuck naked, <laughs> ran to the end of the block uncontested. Well, he was not going to be seen chasing a naked lady down C Street. <laughs> The atmosphere was so rarefied on account of the great altitude that one's blood lay near the surface always. And therefore the scratch of a pin was a disaster worth worrying about, for chances were a grievous erysipelas would ensue. But to offset this, the thin atmosphere seemed to carry healing to gunshot wounds. Therefore to merely shoot your adversary through both lungs was a thing not likely to afford you any permanent satisfaction, for he would be out within the month looking for you, and not with an opera glass either. I covered the legislature for the enterprise, and in all these years, nothing has changed. Never have I seen a body of men with tongues so handy and information so uncertain. Oh, they could talk for a week without ever getting rid of an idea. <laughs> if any one of them had been on hand when the Creator was at the point of saying, let there be light, we never would have got it. <laughs> No, the Nevada legislature meets every two years for 60 days, when they uprightly meet every 60 years for two days. <laughs> when the Nevada legislature is in session, nobody is safe. <laughs> ah, but we had fun. I remember attending a ball over in Gold Hill in a ramshackle, dismal old part of a place. It was lighted from end to end with tallow candle chandeliers made out of barrel hoops suspended from the ceiling. The grease stripped all over us. There were two or three hundred stalwart men present dancing with cordial energy, half of them representing women. Yes, each with a handkerchief tied around his left arm to distinguish him from the men. I was a lady myself. I wore a revolver in my belt. So did all of the other ladies. <laughs> Nevada truly was battle for. <laughs> well, I know I might have told you how I took my name on the river, two fathoms being safe water, twain being the biblical term for two. And I stuck to that story all my life to protect my wife. I didn't want her knowing how it carried on back then. But I can tell you the truth. You see, we would put the paper to bed at the Enterprise and go over to the corner saloon for a restorative to sweeten the bilge waters a little. And old John Piper had the corner saloon. He was a very gracious proprietor. He had a board behind the bar. It was a chalkboard. And on occasion, he would mark a credit for his favorite customers, which I am proud to say I was one. These were days before the Internal Revenue Service or record keeping of any consequence, or even currency. We dealt in coins, silver mostly, 
some gold. Be such a good thing that no sooner, no sooner would I walk through those swinging doors of the corner saloon with one of my drinking companions than a regular would shout out, Mark Twain! And John Piper would mark two on the board behind the bar. <laughs> so now you know the truth, the petrified truth. I might have stayed longer than my 21 months at the Territorial Enterprise, yes, but for a fellow by the name of Laird, James Laird. He was editor for the competition, the Daily Union. Imagine we had four daily newspapers up there back then. We were larger than Los Angeles at the time. And this fellow Laird, perhaps you've known someone like him in your lifetime, but he was endowed with a stupidity that with the slightest stretch would wrap twice around the globe in time. <laughs> and he slandered my good name in his newspaper. Well, if you must know, he called me a liar, a poltroon, and a puppy. Well, I slandered him back in the Enterprise. This went back and forth two or three days until I had to call him a coward and challenge him to a duel, which was imprudent. Oh, I wore a sidearm, yes, but that was only so as not to be conspicuous. I didn't know how to shoot one. And even if I did, I couldn't hit a tent from the inside. But my friend Gillis knew how to fire. So Gillis and I went out to the appointed spot for the duel out at Six Mile Canyon a half hour early to practice. And Gillis was such a good shot that he took the head off a mud hand just as Larry came riding up on his pony. And Gillis was quick enough to hand me that smoking sidearm and say, nice shot, Sam. Don't kill him. Just shoot his nasty face off. <laughs> well, Laird heard that. He did twice around on his pony and off he went. But I was not far behind. For Governor Nye issued a warrant for my arrest for dueling, which had just been made illegal in Nevada. So I decamped for San Francisco to be unemployed. Coldest winter I ever spent in my life was a summer in San Francisco. <laughs> when I laid down my pen at the Territorial Enterprise, I had four horse whippings and two duels owing to me. But when I said goodbye to Nevada, I knew I was saying goodbye to the most vigorous enjoyment of life I would ever be afforded. Those days were full to the brim with a wine of life, and there have been no others like them. Well, that's about enough history for one day. Let's have some fun. Every now and again, old Jim Blaine would get comfortably and sociably charged and tell the story of his grandfather's old ram. But to mention the old ram in the first sentence is as far as anybody ever heard again. For he always meandered off interminably from one thing to another until his whiskey got the best of him. Here's how it sounded. There never was a better old ram than he was. Grandfather fetched him from Illinois, from a galoot by the name of... Not a Sacramento Smith, no, this was an Indiana Smith. Them Sacramento Smiths is nobody's. <laughs> Grandfather got that old ram all fenced in, and he, he dropped a ten-cent piece there in the grass. And he was a stooping over looking for that ten cent piece when the ram noticed him in that attitude and took it for an invitation. And his grandfather didn't notice the ram. And here he come, busting off the ridge with business in his eye. 
No. No, it wasn't a Smith. It, it was a Jefferson, is what it was. <laughs> no, Miss Jefferson, there was a good soul. Had a glass eye and used to lend it to old Miss Wagner, who hadn't any, to receive company in. But it weren't big enough. Miss Jefferson had a number seven, and Miss Wagner was excavated for a 14. So when Miss Wagner weren't noticing why it would get twisted around in the socket, maybe, and look up, maybe one to side, every which way. Whilst the other one was looking straight ahead as a spyglass. <laughs> well, yes, one little wink in that handmade eye would lay over. Well, grown people didn't mind it, but it mostly always made the children cry. <laughs> she tried packing it in raw cotton, but it didn't seem to work. Somehow the cotton would get loose and stick out and look so kind of awful the children couldn't stand it. And she was always dropping it out and turning up her old dead life on the company empty and making everybody so uncomfortable. Because she didn't know when it hopped out being blind on that side of the So somebody'd have to hunch her and say, Your game eyes, fetch loose, Miss Wagner here. Then they'd all have to sit and wait till she jammed it back in again, wrong side out as a gentleman. <laughs> wrong side out didn't make much difference really because the glass eye was sky blue on the front side and gilded on the back side so when miss wagner would get excited why it would begin to whirl and it would flash yellow and blue and yellow no no it wasn't the jefferson it was a hogadonis now sarah hogadon there was a woman she could have the barrel of flour faster than I could flip a flapjack. And she was friends with Lem, my cousin Lem. And Lem was uptown one day with his dog. What was that dog's name? Lem was leaning up against the scaffold and drunk or sick or something. And there was an Irishman up on the second floor with a hod full of bricks. That Irishman's foot slipped down, he'd come, bricks and all. Live on a perfect stranger. Not the living aspirations right out of it. It was an accident, they said. Well, there ain't no such thing as an accident, but don't have the divine hand of providence to it. And the object of that providence was to save the Irishman. If the stranger hadn't have been there, the Irishman had have been killed. So then you might want to ask, if it was providence, why weren't the dog applied it? Well, for a very good reason. The dog would have seen him coming. You can't appoint a dog to a special providence. What's that dog's name? <laughs> I had an uncle got himself killed up here once. It was just awful. The poor man never had any insurance, and he was always sorry about it afterwards. It was on the 4th of July, and this uncle of mine, all full of patriotism, opened his mouth to a rock, and a rocket went right down his throat. Well, before he had a chance to ask for a glass of water to quench the thing, it blew up. And for 24 hours, it rained buttons recognizable as his. A man could not have an experience like that and be entirely cheerful for the rest of his life. <laughs> It was that dog's thing. <laughs> and there was a fellow who went to see that Dr. Tushmaker up in Virginia City to have his tooth out. Dr. Tushmaker was very good at his craft. He used to practice pulling teeth on iron rakes. Well, a patient came in and sat in the chair. The dentist pulled and the tooth wouldn't come. But the patient's right foot come up. The dentist said, what are you doing that for? He said, uh, I don't know. I can't help it. Well, then you go home, come back in a week, I'll take care of you. During the week, old Dr. Tushmaker, he invented an instrument combining the properties of the screw, the lever, the wedge, the hammer, and the inclined plane. Well, the patient came back and sat in the chair. 
One turn of the crank, and out came that tooth. Its roots were hooked under the patient's right big toe. And his entire skeleton was extracted with the tooth. They had to send him home in a pillowcase. But no matter, old Dr. Tushmaker, he got a patent on that instrument. Yes, as a turkey deep boner. Well, I don't suppose we ever will find out what happened to grandfather's old ram. Well, now, my favorite part of the afternoon, the Q and O, as opposed to the Q and A, because if I don't have an answer, at least I'll have an opinion. <laughs> so now's your opportunity. I traveled across this great land of ours in our schools, and I had a seventh grade boy ask me once, Mr. Twain, who was president when you were my age? I said, well, I knew when I was your age. <laughs> Look it up in the library, why don't you? You gotta love those seventh graders. I would see as many as 10 schools a week, and I do secondary mostly, kids that are reading Huckleberry. And on Thursday, I schedule an elementary school to see those fresh faces and share the jumping frog story. And then on Friday, I would schedule a middle school to keep from getting soft. <laughs> and then I would come home on a gurney. <laughs> yes, sir, you had a question? You have been a hero as a role model to so, so many people when you were growing up. Did you have anyone that you viewed as a role model or something you had a I'm trying to think of two ways to answer that. Uh, let me do it this way. <clears throat> One person I admired all along, along with Mark Twain, was uh, Will Rogers. I think they're cut from the same cloth, don't you? And uh, I read Will Rogers' biography, and in that biography, a friend of Will's bet him $50 he could not make President Calvin Coolidge smile. They were about to meet. His friend was watching when they shook hands, and Silent Cal broke into a beaming smile right off the top. So Will's friend asked him when he paid him his fifty dollars, "What could you have said to make him break into that beaming, beautiful smile off the top like that?" And Will said, "Oh, I just drew him close, and I, I said, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name." <laughs> Somehow that stuck in my head. We had this wonderful event we used to, and the pandemic kind of interrupted things called the Sheep Dip at the Nugget. It's always sold out, and we roast our politicians and celebrities and people who need it. <laughs> and uh, I was all mic'd up, and the spotlights were on me, and I was making my way through the crowd toward the stage. And I passed the governor's table, and he reached out, and I took his hand, and I said, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name. <laughs> and his eyes went a little bit like this, and he said, uh, uh, Sandoval. I said, Sandoval, Sandoval, that's a very presidential sounding name. Well, vice presidential anyways. <laughs> When I got to my room that night at the Nugget, I, I pointed up there and I had to thank Will for that moment. But even better yet, we had a Chautauqua down in Boulder City not long after that. And it was a fun four days with Julia Child, a um, lady who wrote a column in 900 newspapers. Mm, I remember back. Yay! And Will Rogers. 
Wow. We each had our own evening, but we hung out together during the day. So I was able to buy him a drink and thank him for that kindness that he did me. And the, the reason I'm answering this with such a long, uh, a good question that I'm answering it so long is, I want to encourage people here today to think about Chautauqua, about becoming someone you admire who's been dead for a while, and taking it into the classrooms, and in, into uh, dining halls and around the world. It will give you another life. Will Rogers and I were able to sit together and have drinks and talk to each other across the ages. It's really a special treat. Yeah. Had another question? Yes, dear? Mr. Twain, when did you visit Russia and what was the uh, recognition that you received there? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. When did I visit Russia? Uh, our State Department sent me to Europe and worked in our uh, Defense Department schools on three different occasions, five weeks each time, I'd see ten schools a week. It was a lot of fun, I got to see all of Germany. And on one of those trips, I got an invitation from the uh, City Council of St. Petersburg to lecture at Leningrad University and spent a week and they tour me around. Well, what are you going to say? It was during Perestroika and Glasnost, and off I went. And when I lectured at Leningrad University, the first question I got from the kids was, you're from Nevada, right? Yes, the great state of Nevada. Can we see your gun? <laughs> now that you have a gun, can we see your gun? <laughs> They toured me around, let me climb in Sputnik 2, treated me like an elder statesman. I have not had a warmer welcome outside of Texas than I did in Russia. I only wish we could do that today. Recently, I wrote an open letter to Vladimir Putin, and I sent it to various uh, media outlets around Russia, and got hacked. I know. So, I only wish I could go over there now, today, and warm things up a little, but it doesn't seem like it might be happening tomorrow. Yes, dear? Oh, ghosts in Virginia City, there are plenty of them. And I'll tell you where they hang out mostly. Upstairs at Piper's Opera House. Yes. I'll tell you how I know that. Carol Piper Marshall used to let me get ready for a show up there. I got to do two, 200 shows at Piper's in the summer of 88. And so every day, six days a week, I would go up in my green room, which it wasn't even green, but it was full of spirits, wonderful spirits, and we communed out there. So I'm, I'm convinced there are ghosts in Virginia City. And most of them, at least the ones that I like, are upstairs in Piper's. So we'll be there on the 30th of September for Steve and Johnny's uh, benefit for the Comstock Foundation. And I think I'm going to go, go upstairs and get ready up there for the last time and say goodbye to my good friends upstairs at Piper. It was so nice to Carol Piper Marshall. I was just getting started 35 years ago and I got a call from her and I was visiting school rooms and she said, I understand you're over for Craig Mark Twain. I said, yeah, I'm getting to see 10 schools a week and I'm just loving it. She said, how'd you like to come up here to Piper's Opera House and do two shows a day, six days a week for four months? Wow. So I was able to try out new material in a live audience every day. And so much of Twain's writing is wonderful literature, but it doesn't recite. And you don't know the difference until you've actually tried it on a modern audience. I'll never do letters from the earth again. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a wonderful break. 
and, and when you're in the performing arts business, you do need a break like that, and boy, that was it for me. Piper. So that's where we're going to go full circle in September on the 30th. Yes, sir. Mr. Twain, would you vote for Ulysses Grant again? Oh, would I vote for Ulysses Grant again? <laughs> uh, I'd like to say this about President Grant. To a manifestly brave man, dying is nothing. Dying is nothing to a manifestly brave man. So I was there at the end when, when he had the throat cancer and was trying to get that book published. And then we were actually able to publish it with my publishing company and got it out. And I was able to hand Mrs. Grant a check, a royal pay check, the largest of its kind to that day, for $200,000. After the general had been called home and had brought her family out of debt. A few years ago, I went to uh, the Gramercy, um, the Players Club, the Gramercy Park in New York, because I wanted to see the cue stick they have above the fire that was Mark Twain's cue stick. And the, and the uh, guest there, he, he asked me, can you uh, come with me and I'll show you something that has something to do with Mark Twain? but we don't know what. He took me into a dark room, it looked like it hadn't been used in a long time. He started pulling open drawers that had death masks in them. It was the creepiest place I've ever been in. And he finally found what he was looking for. It was that check, canceled check for $200,000 from Mrs. Grant. I said, you need to keep this in the safe place. But that's where it was the last time I saw it. Oh, that's not oh, wow. And I'd like to say this, it goes with your question about things we don't know about. <laughs> we shot a documentary in the Hartford home, and they let me wander around while they were setting up the lighting in the billiards room. And I started to go into a downstairs guest room, and I reached for the doorknob, and my hand pulled away instinctively without my knowing why. I would find out later that day, that's the room where Susie died. Mark Twain's life had run out his 24-year-old daughter. My hand knew I did not want to go into that room when my brain did. When you figure that out, let me know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got time for a couple more questions here. Then George promised me a Mark Twain cocktail. Yeah. Oh yes, dear, we're in the back. How did you get interested in Joan of Oh, how did I get interested in Joan of Arc? I think I got a tap on the shoulder. <laughs> she is the most remarkable person, with the exception of one, that has ever walked the planet of either sex, I think. I will caution you, though, when you, if you read that book, it breaks down in the trial, and you might as well just set the book down at that point. But it's my favorite book of mine. It was 12 years in the preparation. The others got no preparation and deserved none. <laughs> Even though that was my favorite book of mine, nobody else likes it. But there is a little bit of humor in there in spite of it all. She was amazing. One more question here. Yes, dear? Oh, I like that question. Thank you. It's a good one to end on. You know, what, what kind of reading do I do to keep up and make things work the best I can? And uh, 
it's just constant study. I, had, I finally had to make, make a rule for myself that every other book I read has to be a non-Twain book. <laughs> Preferably not a dead white guy. <laughs> And that has helped me immensely. But when you start to study a character like this, you can go down the rabbit hole. And I've, I've seen Chicago characters get a little bit mixed up sometimes and, and get the characters mixed up. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, it brings a smile. <laughs> but in, in my case, I am happy being in one white suit, and I don't think I could handle anybody else. But again, and I think this is a good note to close on, please give some thought, and I don't care how old you think you are or how much time you think you have left on this earth, Give some thought of studying somebody that you admire and bringing that person to life in this classroom. You won't be disappointed, I promise. Well, there are a thousand reasons why I shouldn't take a drink, but I can't think of one right now. Thank you very much.